the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Basket Case 3, The Progeny, released in 1991. Basket Case 3 is a direct continuation of Part 2, continuing to focus on Granny Ruth and her unique individuals, as well as Belial's very pregnant girlfriend, Eve. And we all know how that came about. <laughs> I'm shocked anyone still watches the show. This third installment also leans even further into comedy, with some entire scenes that only serve as throwaway jokes. Basket Case 3 is widely considered to be the weakest installment of the trilogy, even by Frank Henenlotter himself. Basket Case 3 is the one and only film I've made that I'm really disappointed in. Because he's a real one, Henenlotter blames himself for the subpar quality, admitting that he shouldn't have rushed into making another sequel so soon after part two. Let's just say that I really didn't have um, a solid uh, story. Since the studio wanted another movie with the basket case name, former Fangoria editor, the late Robert Martin, helped co-write a script recycling all the props and costumes they still had from the second film in order to keep costs down. In Hemenlotter's defense, I don't think Basket Case 3 is bad, really. It's mostly just a nothing movie. The unique individuals were fun to look at in part two, but they don't have enough personality to sustain another film. Plus, Belial's role is significantly diminished, and when I'm watching Basket Case, I want to be watching my Basket Boy, damn it! Let me hear a scream, for old time's sake. <laughs> That's my man. Though it's largely unnecessary, I will give credit to the progeny for some jokes that made me laugh and some kills that made me cheer. And that, of course, brings me to today's sponsor. Bespoke Post is a subscription club that sends you themed boxes every month filled with all sorts of awesome products. At least $70 worth of them, but for only 45 bucks. I took a short quiz about what I like and don't like, and then they picked a box for me based on my preferences. If you don't love what Bespoke Post sends you, you can swap it out for another box, no problem. I got their Weekender box, which included this stylish tote for when I can travel again, and their Parlor box, which will help me booze it up in style. I also got a real cozy wool sweater and this warm alcove blanket, which shows just how varied their boxes of awesomeness are. There are dozens of box options that change every month, and since it's free to join, there's no reason to wait. Click the link in the description and take their short quiz to get box suggestions based on your preferences. Or you can go to BespokePost.com and use promo code DEADMEAT20 to get 20% off your first box. Join the club today, and thanks again to Bespoke Post for sponsoring. Will an increase in jokes result in a decrease in dead bodies? Let's check our math and get to the kills. The movie begins with a recap. Remember this shit? Of course! How could you ever forget? After a full five minutes of review, we end up at the title card! Though this one doesn't have the decency to drip for us. Pfft. Dwayne Bradley is in a padded room with Belial already removed from his side again. A crazed ass looking Granny Ruth shows up and tells Dwayne it's been months since the end of the second film. In that time, some things have changed, especially between Belial and Eve. She's pregnant, Dwayne. Your brother's girlfriend is pregnant. You mean... I'm gonna be an uncle? Eve's been getting tended to by a unique individual named Simon, but unfortunately Simon's just an amateur. With an uncertain and potentially dangerous birth approaching, Ruth wants to go on a road trip to Georgia to see a real medical pro named Uncle Hal. What do you think of that, Dwayne? I thought we were gonna see Bilal. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, dude. Give us the B-Man! But we don't get the B-Man, not even after Dwayne apologizes to him for his actions. Oh, <laughs> Dwayne also apologizes to Granny Ruth for accidentally killing her granddaughter. You'd think she'd be a little more pissed about that. With one campy yell that doesn't really work for me, All aboard! Granny Ruth and her school bus of unique individuals hit the road. We see some that we know, Frederick's driving, that Chop Top guy's reading Camus, and some that are new. I like the fish lady named Mackerel, and a guy named Cedric. Oh, Cedric, I see you brought your lettuce. Cedric has three feet of vertebrae sticking out his head, and was designed by a returning Gabe Bartalos, who had a bit more time than he did for Basket Case 2, which he used to update returning individuals and design many new ones. The bus ride is mostly a fun one, except for the fact that Eve is lying in the back, yowling in pain from contractions. Man, if only there were a way to drown out all that yelling. Whoa, 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 
try to prove my love to you. Um, wait. What? Yep, Basket Case 3 has a musical number wherein Annie Ross sings Lloyd Price's personality with the individuals backing her on horns, including Cedric rocking out on a tenor. Cause he's got this scene is a perfect example of how they just threw shit at the wall for this movie, and Hennenlotter doesn't even try to deny it. Why don't I add a musical number? I mean, if that doesn't tell you that somebody's out of their fucking mind. Funnily enough, they were able to get this song's rights for a single dollar when the owner found out that it'd be Annie Ross singing it. After all, she was a famous jazz singer in the 50s and 60s and continued to perform until her death in 2011. I'm glad they had a good time making this thing. Well, that was just... Fun. The bus drives across the blue border into Georgia, and they stop at a convenience store so Ruth can stock up on plastic toys and latex condoms. Lots and lots of condoms. While she's inside, Dwayne takes advantage of a contraction distraction to attempt an escape. It doesn't quite work out for him, but he does meet a very Susan-looking young woman named Opal. He tells Opal that he and that basket back there are wanted for murder in New York, but he's unable to get her to take him seriously, given in the straight jacket and all. You're a major loon, Dwayne. Do you know that? Dwayne pops his head back into the bus before Opal's father arrives. He's the sheriff of this town and was happy to help Granny Ruth carry her groceries and condoms back to the bus. We also saw earlier that Sheriff Griffin is good friends with Uncle Hal, who Ruth's on her way to visit, though he's only seen Hal's son, Little Hal, from a distance, interacting with him mostly through gadgets and gizmos aplenty. Granny Ruth's bus pulls up to Uncle Hal's Georgian mansion shot on location near Atlanta, and unloads its excitable individuals so they can express joy in seeing their old friend again. Hal gives Ruth a hug and introduces himself to Dwayne, then checks on the heavy-breathing Eve, who is having quite the roiling pregnancy right now. Better act fast, Hal. That water is going, going, gone! Who boy! That bus is having an amniotic flood! As the individuals move into Hal's house, he admits to Ruth that this job may be too complex for him. Luckily, he's got someone who can handle it, the splotchy skinned, bobbin' and weaving little Hal, who's real happy to see Granny Ruth. Son. Yeah, if you remember from part two, Granny Ruth's backstory involved having a child. Gave birth to a boy with 11 arms. Apparently, that 11-armed son didn't actually die, but instead grew up as Uncle Hal's charge. You know, I'm happy for Ruth, but not really for myself. Little Hal annoys me. Dwayne convinces Granny Ruth to let him out of his straitjacket, saying he promises to be a good boy and that he won't bother his brother. Of course, no sooner has she left the room than he makes an escape. While Dwayne's gone, we get the big birthing scene, which requires all hands on deck. Belial is invited to witness the birth of his progeny, which finally gives us our favorite basket boy a full 33 minutes into the film. Unfortunately, the sight of doctory stuff gives Belial flashbacks to 1982, when evil doctors like Needleman performed a hectic Belialectomy. Now, this is not gonna work if he's squirming around. Hold him still. The memory upsets Belial so much, he attacks Uncle Hal, face-hugging him, and biting away until Elise decides that it's needle in time. Go to sleep, little boy. Back in the basket with ye. Uncle Hal is left with Belial's trademark face lacerations and at the worst possible time, too. Cause Eve's leaking scope right now. Push out all that mouthwash, Eve. As little Hal stands watch with a video recorder, Ruth delivers Eve's baby, her beautiful bloody baby. <laughs> I'm, don't let that affect you. It was just my gut instinct. Okay, that reaction made me laugh, but as Ruth continues to pull out Belial Baby after Belial Baby, Little Hal keeps the commentary running with increasingly diminishing returns. Seven, don't tell me! Seven, number seven, all from heaven! Originally, Hemingwater wrote an 11-page birthing scene full of blood and flying fluids, but the producers at Shapiro Glickenhaus were worried it'd be too offensive. With a huge hole in the screenplay, Hemingwater turned to comedian Jim O'Doherty, the guy playing Little Hal, to fill the space. What began as a written poem quickly turned into a frantic improvisation that, try as he might, just doesn't work for me. So that whole scene of him reacting to the babies 
is him making it up on the spot in a state of panic. And he has no idea what to do next. And he can't believe I haven't yell cut yet, but he knows he's not supposed to stop. So when you watch that, that is an actor, a brilliant comic actor in a state of panic, coming up with non secutors that at one point he goes, name one, one, and he looks at Bob Paoni, the DP, and he goes, name one, Bob. Eve ends up giving birth to a full dozen little snappers, and we get a non sequitur throwaway gag when Ruth wonders what Belial's thinking. Turns out, he's thinking of topless twins pampering him as they recite Shakespeare. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Kind of a generic joke here, until the fantasy women begin breathlessly speaking of geometry. A trapezoid is one of the <sighs> simplest yet most intriguing of polygons. And bureaucratic bylaws. That is how you make a cliche funny. Also kind of funny? Nose guy's line delivery here. Hey dude, you're a dad. Dude, you're getting a dad, is what I would say to these 12 wailing babies right now. Isn't that exciting, B? The individuals celebrate the birth with one of their signature bumpin' parties. Seriously, these folks are always having a blast. It's good to see. Even if Belial's still got some socializing work to do. Sitting there looking like peanut butter baby. Ruth leaves the festivities to check in on Hal, who's being watched over by Simon. How is he? Pretty good, considering most of his face is on. Okay, Simon just became my favorite. Also, this is the last time we see Uncle Hal in this movie. I don't know, they just kind of forget to show him again after this. Dwayne makes his way to the sheriff's department, where he shouts out to that girl he met earlier. I forgot your name, but I'm over here! That is too real, I love it. He runs up to Opal with some manic rantings, even recycling the dreams he had with Susan from part two. Can't we just get out of here? I mean, just the two of us, before they find us. But what's fun about Opal is that she's not just a generic pretty face who quickly falls in love with Dwayne. She gets his ass locked up because, um, yeah, dude is sounding pretty dangerous. And sure enough, he is a wanted man. Traitor! I trusted you! Dwayne, it's not my fault. You're a major criminal. A young cop named Bailey sees that Dwayne's brother has a million dollar bounty out on him, so he and fellow officer Baxter head out to Uncle Hal's, knowing that Belial is there after Dwayne mentioned it to Opal earlier. The cops get to Hal's house and see the festivities through a window. A fucking convention of <laughs> Jesus, that one looks like a fish. And determined to get that million dollar reward, the two of them climb into an open window and find a crib full of the titular progeny. Little baby Belial's. Oh shit, little baby Belial's. Baxter decides that they can use the babies as bait, which wakes up and pisses off Eve. The cops think it's Belial, though, and Bailey tells Baxter to shoot. <laughs> Yo, fuck, they just shot Eve! And I know she's not strictly humanoid, but she is a unique individual. Since I would count Belial if he died, I'm gonna count Eve here. The cops grab the babies and just barely escape the angry individuals including a super sad Simon and a heartbroken Belial. <laughs> Dwayne feels Belial's pain through their psychic connection, which seems to, uh, turn Opal on? You really are a strange one, aren't you, Dwayne? Dangerous and confused. An animal, Dwayne. Just like your brother. <laughs> Okay, so she is into Dwayne, just not in the usual way. Opal's got a kink and seems to get off on power, making her more of an antagonist than a love interest. It makes for a funny scene when her dad, Sheriff Griffin, walks in on them. What if I told you about messing with my prisoners? <laughs> like, how are you about to threaten your daughter with a grounding when she's wearing assless stockings? Speaking of which, you might want to reconsider your forms of punishment, dude. I'm gonna take you across my knee and personally spank the living daylights out of you! Bailey and Baxter get back to the police station, and after showing Sheriff Griffin the Belial babies, are given quite the alliterative directive. You boys have been through a lot tonight. Bailey, you book the Bradley boy. Baxter, take the bassinet of baby Belial's in back and get Brody to come by. Where's Brennan and Ben? Bowling. Well fucking done. 
The sheriff heads to Hell's to check on his old friend, interrupting the funeral service going on inside for Eve. He shoots his way in and calls out for Hell, but I told you, that dude's not in the movie anymore. So instead he finds the individuals and their overseer. Things start to get heated until a contraption controlled by Little Hell rolls up and stops the sheriff. It leads him to some double doors that give him and the audience their first full look at Little Hell. And gotta say y'all, his name's a bit of a misnomer there. Dude's not very little at all. Also, sorry, but could we please cut the shot already? Jim O'Doherty clearly has nothing to do but wave and wiggle. Cut away! We cut away to the police station, where the baby Belisles are getting poked at and teased by some new cops who have arrived. Opal even takes one to Dwayne. Oh my god, that's a little Belisle. That's a little baby Belisle and teases him with it, saying she's gonna make it her pet. Damn, this girl's a nasty one. The cops hear a knock on their door, and when Officer Brennan finds a random basket out front, he brings it inside without inspecting it, which I'm sure is SOP for suspicious packages at police stations. As to be expected, Belial jumps out of the basket and kills Officer Brennan by squeezing his neck until his eyes pop out. Awesome! That kill was actually supposed to be a lot gorier, since Hennenlotter wanted this movie to be even bloodier than the original. You know, I was making the comedy a little more comical than I normally would, thinking I was going to make the blood a lot more violent. Unfortunately, he was once again stymied by the producers, who at one point wanted to make this thing PG-13. <laughs> a PG-13 Hennen Lauder film. Get the fuck out of here. Another cop, Banner, reaches for a gun only to get his face bitten by Belial. But not with the standard generic fake blood smearing. Belial rips off this guy's face flesh like it's a fucking fruit roll-up. Then he just ups and finishes it with a decapitation. God damn. We haven't seen you enough in this movie, Belial, but at least you're making the most of your time. The last cop at the station, Brody, takes aim at Belial with a shotgun, but Belial stares him down and gets the jump on him. Opal releases Dwayne from his cell so he can calm Belial down, but when they run back to the commotion, she gets shot in the chest accidentally and killed. Oh, and she squishes a baby Belial with her butt, which I will also count. Oh no. Oh yeah, Dwayne. If I counted Eve, I've also got to count the baby Belial. Finally, Belial kills Brody by twisting his head around backwards in an effect that looks very screaming mad George. Actually, all of these effects do, come to think of it. Dwayne rebaskets Belial, but is unable to unlock the cell with all the babies before Sheriff Griffin gets back and shoots them away. Aw, your dominatrix daughter's dead? Bet you wish the last thing you said to her wasn't about spanking, huh? Dwayne runs Belial back to little Hal, who's real handy when it comes to inventing stuff, probably because of all the hands. Right now, he's whipping something up that Dwayne designed for his brother. From the look of those blueprints, we bout to have a mecha belial. The next morning, Officer Baxter wakes up to find he's not alone in bed, because next to him is the claw, which whirls around and kills him off screen as Dwayne waits patiently outside for Belial to finish his mecha murder. At his own home, Officer Bailey wakes up wearing some awesome undies and hunks out in the mirror a bit before a buzzsaw starts cutting through the bathroom wall. His death is also off screen, though at least this one has a funny gag where he wrestles with the machine in the background. The unique individuals have a funeral for Eve where poems are read and mucus is excreted. Granny Ruth gives another rallying monologue, a cheap imitation of her attic polemic from the second film, and it encourages them all to drive over to the police station where they find some leftover carnage and one very sad sheriff. As his dead daughter breathes on the desk in front of him, Sheriff Griffin tells Granny Ruth he'll only hand over the babies if they give him Belial, since he's the one responsible for Opal's death. They make a deal to meet that night, and then the individuals head out to get lunch in a totally inconsequential scene that I wouldn't have bothered including, except for the fact that the restaurant manager is played by Beverly Bonner in a cameo. Oh, ma'am, you're going too fast. I didn't get that, ma'am. Ma'am. And I love her. Oh, and the place is called Mighty Casey's? That's fun. That night, Sheriff Griffin takes the babies to an old factory on the edge of town to trade them for their daddy. Well, if you really wanted Belial, Sheriff, I've got good news and bad Bad news for you. Good news is he's here. Bad news is he's a fucking Megazord. Mecha Belial knocks aside the sheriff's weapons with ease, and though their fight scene is a far cry from any John Woo jam, like most of it is this one unimpressive shot, it eventually ends with Belial on the ground and the sheriff covered in his babies, getting nommed on all to bits and being killed off screen. 
This is gonna be some family. The movie ends with a daytime talk show spoofing Geraldo, becoming overrun by Granny Ruth's unique individuals. Belial grabs the talk show host's face, and Granny Ruth tells the audience that the individuals have arrived and are here to stay. Have a nice day. Parenthood can sometimes keep you from your hobbies. Was Belial still able to kill a bunch of people? Let's find out at the numbers. Okay, cut. There were nine kills in Basket Case 3, with the victims consisting of six male cops, one female Opal, one female Eve, and a baby Belial of unknown gender. But boy did it spit out a lot of blood. With a runtime of 90 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 10 minutes even. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Officer Banner. His lip stretching and tearing like that is just so freaking nasty. And I'm always down for a decapitation as a punctuation to a kill. Dull Machete for lamest kill will go to Officer Baxter, who had the least bloody and least funny off-screen death. And that's it. Basket Case 3 The Progeny came out in 1991 and left Frank Henenlotter so deflated he wouldn't direct another movie until 2008, when he made Bad Biology with his friend, rapper R.A. the Rugged Man. That's why he was in some of the behind-the-scenes footage in the first Basket Case kill count. Good job spotting him, you eagle-eyed commenters. Next week you'll get your kill count a day early, as I'm looking at Pilgrim on Thanksgiving. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count on Basket Case 3, The Progeny. I want to thank some patrons like Rich Ditz, Campbell J. Parker, LJ Don 5, Nash Sanadiki, Tyler Tarwater, and Casey Walker. I've been tweeting about the future Kill Count schedule, so if you want to know more, check out Deadbeat James on Twitter. Or, you know, you can just have it a surprise. Be good people.